Welcome to today's webinar, the first in a series of three organized by FXCM in cooperation with us, the Python Quants Group. My name is Yves Filpisch. I'm founder and managing partner of Python Quants Group, and I will guide you through today's webinar. I'm really excited to cooperate with FXCM in this regard uh, because People at FXCM have understood from my point of view pretty well that algorithmic trading is part of the future in the financial industry and in particular a very important one. That's the reason why this has become a strategic initiative. And also, uh, also to my delight, <laughs> that Python is kind of a powerful language and platform technology to do algorithmic trading in our field. So uh, two things come together, Python and algorithmic trading. This is something that we do more or less uh, all the year over in the form of events, in the form of consulting, development, open source, and in particular also in the form of training. More on this later on. Um, they have also um, piled up a couple of organizational questions. I think that uh, we will answer most of them during this um, webinar. I have prepared uh, some introductory slides to which I have shared already the link in the chat. So please have a look at the chat room as well, uh, where I do announcement of interest to everybody. I've also shared the link to a gist with all the codes that I'm going to present and use today. So you will be able to replicate everything that I'm going to do. So nothing here is in that sense uh, closed behind the doors, black box. Uh, we try to live here open source policy and not only open source, it's also about open data. Obviously, without the data, what I'm going to show uh, would not be possible. Let me dive into my uh, slide deck. And before I get started with the contents, uh, like usual, please read carefully the risk disclaimer, in particular with regard to trading Forex and CFD, uh, CFDs. On margin um, so there are uh, multiple risks that you need to consider you also need to consider your personal situation I'm pretty sure that you have read these carefully already but nevertheless once in a while you should do this again and again and you will also find the other resources um, copy of the text here the agenda first I want to uh, briefly talk a little bit uh, about the Python Quants group or group because I'm pretty sure that you know uh, FXCM already well, uh, but maybe you haven't heard of our group. So I will spend a few minutes on our group and what we have been doing in the field. Then I will touch upon the driving forces in algorithmic trading um, to then ask the question, hopefully to answer it satisfactorily, why Python for algorithmic trading? So there are, of course, alternatives, but I think there are a couple of reasons why we should uh, use Python. Then the major part will be about a live demo where I will quickly show how to use Python and Pandas for backtesting, working with uh, FXM historical tick data and uh, adding indicators uh, to data sets, and also a little bit about uh, visualization of open, high, low, close data and adding studies like, let's say, RSI to such data sets and to have a nice visualization. Today, we won't really talk about strategies. Um, we won't talk about the API that will come out soon. These are all topics of the uh, upcoming webinars. But I think this is a very good start because without data, uh, I think there is no real algorithmic trade. That's the same kind of like in every other discipline, uh, discipline in computer science or data science. You need the data, then it can get started. And this is what we do here as well. We get started with the data, and in particular with the historical tick data, which is kind of, um, let's say, high quality source for what we can do with modern approaches in computer science. Um, I see here that um, um, that many other um, many other questions have uh, have piled up here. Um, I will in between do a break and quickly skip through the questions and try to answer them in bulk. I'm pretty sure that there will other questions piling up. Um, in the meantime, I get started now with uh, a quick introduction of what we do. This is the one graphic that, has, that says it all. So we are active in a couple of fields. Uh, the major one is training about Python for finance and algorithmic training, um, doing online training, doing live workshops, doing a boot camp like uh, the upcoming one at the end of November in London over four days, um, organizing other events. So I'm an organizer of one of the biggest Python groups in London, for example, 2,000 
400 people there, Python for Quant Finance. Uh, I've written and published a couple of books. We are active in the open source field. We run a platform with uh, nowadays close to 12,000 users. And we also provide services for financial institutions globally. So uh, you might say, well, this is kind of quite a bit, but the core is Python for finance and algorithmic trading. So we hardly do anything else. Uh, I would say uh, well above 90% of what we do on a daily basis is concerned with Python finance and algorithmic trading. So this is what we do. And then around uh, this core topic, we have all the activities. If you're interested in more detail, please visit our website. Io. If you're interested in what I'm doing, and if you're interested in how I look, here you have a picture giving a talk. This is what I do on a regular basis. Um, two more, for example, are scheduled this week. Um, live talks. Uh, you can visit my personal page not to learn more about myself, but to get access to all the resources from my talks, like slide decks, Jupyter notebooks, codes, gists, uh, YouTube videos, and whatnot. So I think it's a wealth of information if you're interested in the topic via Python for Finance and Algorithms. Trading. These are the three books I published. The most popular one in the middle, Python for Finance, has become kind of a standard reference in the field. Um, but it has come out in print version 2014, and it's a little bit outdated in some areas. So uh, we are just in the course of preparing the second edition, which will come out next year. So uh, watch out for the second one, which will also include a few chapters and more uh, content on algorithmic trading. As one example, we will update it in many, many other areas as well. Our core product in this regard, uh, speaking of Python for algorithmic training, is the university certificate. We are uh, the first to uh, be able to award a university certificate uh, for such an educational program, online program. You see here uh, the brochure. It's kind of quite a bit to study. Um, we have a prolonged period, which we expect people to finish the program to 16 weeks. So it's a 16 week dense program. When you have a look at what is covered in this program, you see how, how fast the field has grown, how fast our offering has grown as well with the field. So you get access to 1,200 plus pages of, of um, um, PDF documentation, 5,000 lines of code, 125 hours of pre-recorded video instruction, 50 Jupyter notebooks. So if you're interested in Python, I'm trading a little bit more. I think we have all the resources to get not only started, but to get um, to a level where you can use it for your own or in your dream job at one of the big financial players. I think that is more than enough as an introduction for what we do. I think you have learned that we are mostly concerned with Python for finance and algorithmic trading. But now let us dive into the driving forces in algorithmic trading and in open source and finance in general. So a couple of mega trends are noteworthy. We have, of course, this huge open source um, community development wave that we see since now, we can say decades. Uh, just have a look at GitHub, how many repositories are there? What kind of fantastic uh, tools you get there? Hardware, open infrastructure. You can, within minutes, you can fire up professional, scalable, cheap infrastructure, and you can destroy it within seconds even afterwards. So we have access in principle to unlimited compute power, open data. Today, the webinar is mostly about open data. So it's one of the fantastic um, developments that we see that companies like FXCM provide the uh, financial analyst, the algorithmic trader with high quality open data sets here, even in the form of tick data, which is all but the norm. But still we see many, many such, um, uh, such activities in the market. And today we will cover one of the most exciting ones in the form of historical tick data going back over multiple years. Social networks, I mentioned the group that I run in, in London, 2,400 people there uh, meeting every every other weeks, let's say, and have a meetup with 100 people in attendance, high level uh, talks there about uh, things from AI to low level Python libraries to, um, to other topics relevant uh, to the field. And people cannot only listen to some talks, they can also exchange ideas across boundaries of companies. So it's fantastic. This was, from my point of view, the first wave. Now we're entering the second wave in the sense that from open source, we now get to the point where in this field, we even get access to the cutting edge software like TensorFlow, which is used, for example, to build the Google self-driving car. Um, we have not only something that is open source and thus the trick somehow, now we have the cutting edge open source software in the field. And 
easily accessible from, from PyCloud. Then from standardized commodity open infrastructure, like the cloud going to specialized hardware. With Google AI just recently announced, Google will provide um, uh, TPU-based data centers, which means that they are specifically dedicated towards being as fast as possible with regard to deep learning with TensorFlow. Fantastic development here, and uh, researchers as well as uh, business financial people will get access to that. Then on the other hand, also programmatic APIs. So we'll see in the next webinar how such a programmatic API will look like. But others like, for example, Thomson Reuters uh, recently uh, released their uh, beta version of the API where you get now access, not only from Python, from other languages as well, but Python there is also first class citizen to all the data uh, that is in this huge data lake of Thomson Reuters icon. Fantastic developments here. And today, again, this is uh, mostly in this field, open data, programmatic APIs, is the next webinar uh, where we will uh, live there, but also specialized events. And I would even consider this webinar now a specialized event because it's about open source, it's about open data, it's uh, not that much about hardware, um, but uh, it's kind of specialized in the sense that we are not dealing with general Python and general open data, but no, it's kind of Python used to finance, applied to finance, and also data from the finance field. So here also getting specialized. On the other hand, we see kind of many, many parallels uh, between the machine and deep learning field as well as algorithmic trading. And when you have a look first on the right-hand side, in machine and deep learning, um, a goal might be to build a self-driving car. And uh, mostly what you do there is to do some prediction. Um, how fast uh, is the car driving in front of me? Will it get faster or slower? Most probably will it turn to the right? What do I need to do? When do I need to do it? So these are all questions that a self-driving car has to answer. And the same holds more or less true in algorithmic trading. So what we are after in principle is a money-making machine. It's a machine that does it on its own. Like we are used to drive our own car. We are maybe used to um, do our trades discretionary. But in both fields, we are looking for a machine that does the trick, that does it automatically. So automation here is the goal. Before automation, we have some optimization, training, learning procedures. We do testing, validation, in particular when we think of self-driving car and kind of the risks involved there. <laughs> it might be even more important not to hurt people uh, walking on the sidewalk, for example. The testing and validation, very, very important, but also very important to not lose uh, much money when we have a money-making machine that turns uh, easily into a loss-making machine. We don't want to have that. And the basis for all of that is data algorithms and hardware. And the fantastic thing here, and that's the main reason why I'm showing this slide, is that we in algorithmic trading benefit from all the fantastic developments in the machine and deep learning field. So what, what the people do there, the brilliant geniuses that work there in the hardware, engineers and everybody else like the Googles in the world, uh, we can apply to algorithmic trading and can make use of that. So we used to be kind of a little bit of a separate discipline, um, finance, trading, where we had a little bit of support from the mathematical field. So finance in that sense, mathematical finance and applied math field. But these days there are many, many other areas for which we can simply borrow uh, fantastic tools that we can apply to our field. And this is a development that will uh, tremendously influence our field in, in trading. Basically, algorithmic trading is uh, kind of the discipline of replacing a human brain or a human being. Sometimes trading even requires that you pick up uh, your phone or <laughs> that you type something. So there is also a little bit of kind of um, physicality involved, but let's just say we are only concerned with regard to the decisions to be made. And, and a human being, for example, processes input information, comes up with the output. Like a very simple example uh, to calculate two plus three. So two plus three, we as a human being know, most probably this is five. This is what we learned at school. We, we were trained to master such problems. And an algorithm can replace us. An algorithm doesn't need to have any biological element there. So it simply can be implemented on hardware, non-living hardware. And the basic idea is the same for trading. When a trader sees information in the markets, has read the newspapers, has had a look at Bloomberg Terminal or whatnot, then the trader comes up with a trading decision. With algorithms, it's the same thing. But probably with the machines that we have available these days, 
X can be much, much larger. So we can feed in much, much more data. And we can also get rid of, of emotions, for example, and um, yeah, of the tasks that might not be the, uh, the most appealing ones to us human beings, like reading long uh, rows of data, crunching data, calculations. This is where the machines are good. And if we can replace our intuition, our knowledge, our experience by algorithms, why not go about it and have something scalable, unemotional, um, I would say, I wouldn't say not infallible, but in principle, it's something that does the trick on a non-human basis with hopefully better results since there are a couple of competitive advantages that the machine in combination with algorithms and data might have. Just think of tick data, we will see tick data sets today with like 800,000 rows of data. What shall a human being do with tick data? From my point of view, nothing. But a machine can probably do something with 800,000 rows of data. We are still at the beginning, from my point of view. This uh, book, I wouldn't say is a little bit outdated, but sometimes you get the feeling, you know, two years after the publication of a technological book, <laughs> not a technological book, a book about technology, you sometimes get the feeling that it's outdated. But nevertheless, I like the quote here that uh, all the algorithmic trading that takes place today, uh, the author writes here, is uh, yeah, still simple and makes a limited use of AI, of artificial intelligence. But this is true to change, it says. Artificial intelligence is beneficial in any domain where patterns have to be found in large quantities of data, and effective decisions have to be taken on the basis of those patterns, especially when the decisions have to be taken rapidly. So I think this exactly brings the benefit of machine learning, deep learning as sub-disciplines of artificial intelligence to the point, and uh, we will once again today build the basis in the form of huge data sets that are typically simply not processable by a human being. When you think, are there any success stories out there? For sure there are. I've picked one here that is not too uh, popular from my point of view. They are flying under the radar, as they say. It's a company called Flow Traders. Um, and I just discovered this company, so to say, via this Bloomberg Markets article, uh, 14th of June, not too long ago. And what is fascinating is, is that uh, this is a comparatively small company, like 140 traders um, in a few offices, um, but the turnover is huge. So 640 billion in ETFs and the same amount in futures and other asset classes. So more than 1 trillion turnover for this company. Um, and you see here what they reported at, uh, just before the release of this article is that they had 34 months straight without the loss. So kind of fantastic, but you might say, oh, well, 34 months, uh, I could achieve this as well just by, <laughs> just by, going, uh, by implementing a riskless strategy. But there's a little bit more information that is provided. Uh, first is that this is indeed an algorithmic trading shop, but they point out that they implement a distinctive approach to algo trading. So um, they are trading based on deterministic algorithms, compared to statistical ones, like not something with regard to convergence, pair trading, like the typical ones where statistical methods from the most simple ones like regression are used, but rather here deterministic ones. And you see here, they only make 0.028% on a trade. So this is, for example, something a machine can perfectly live with. So there are no emotions, but just think of the uh, star trader, what, the star, star trader going to lunch and says, well, I've made another, 0.028% this morning. So this is nothing that would excite a human trader. Um, but the most interesting thing of this story, and I'm providing here the link to the story, is that it's not about the 34 months. It's actually that this um, company called Flow Trader hadn't lost money on a single trading day in the 34 months. So when you think of the holy grail in, in finance and algorithmic trading, I think this comes pretty close to it. That you say you have a money-making machine that is trading on a daily basis, large volumes, and doesn't lose a single dime, not on a single day. So, I mean, this is, if we are after something, I think this, uh, this sounds like it. Of course, in the article, there are also, let's say, some critical passages that the field gets more crowded, that margins are coming down, and 
maybe the 0.028% might shrink to 0.018%, for example. But nevertheless, I mean, this is working and nobody says that if something is working right now perfectly well, so to say, it should work for another 10 or 20 years. But if it works for, for let's say here, close to three years at least, there must be something in algorithmic trading that a human trader probably cannot achieve um, in the same fashion. <clears throat> now you might ask, against this background, how shall we go about it? How can we get started? What tools are there that we can make use of all this? And I know that these are very important questions. The one thing, of course, is to have an insight to see what, what's going on there. The other is kind of like, what, what can we use? And Python for me, I mean, our company is called the Python Quant, so there's Python already built in our DNA. But um, I always like to use the, um, the example that I say, if you only have time to learn one foreign language today, it's most, most probably English, because with the English, you can get by all over the world. Almost everybody all over the world has a, a little grasp of English. So, and the same holds true for me with Python. Of course, there are other languages with nice features and so forth, but the basic argument I make is that Python is kind of the English in the computer science world, in the sense of that you have only time to master one language, one platform technology, I think Python is the best choice for doing it. We can go on a little bit more detail, and I have uh, just this one slide here where I say, well, um, without providing proof, I'm just uh, here listing characteristics. Python is open source compared to some vendor developed, maintained um, applications, languages, or whatnot. It's general purpose. You can build a web page, you can do algorithmic trading compared to domain specific languages. It's multi paradigm compared to single paradigm ones. We have a powerful ecosystem of data science, performance technologies, of web frameworks, and so forth. So other fantastic languages might have a weak ecosystem. And I, for everything that I, that I have on the right side, I could name um, a language or an ecosystem, but I don't want to go into the, I just want to show what I think are Python's uh, selling points. That, Python is by now the leading language in data science. That's for sure. All the recent empirical studies show that. Um, there are other languages that are just good in, in, just in finance or in another single area. Uh, Python is a first class citizen in AI. So one of my arguments was that AI is kind of one of the driving and major forces in the field. So we need a language that has access to all the nice AI technology. So, Core technology in finance, this is without doubt the case. When the biggest banks in the world, like Bank of America, JP Morgan, um, you name them, I, the list is kind of endless. And the biggest hedge funds in the world, like AQR, like Two Sigma, like AHL uh, in London, they all have Python as a core technology, not as just a little bit of the side technology. I think this already says that there must be something in it. It's supported by many players. So whenever you see some wrapper around an API, you probably find the Python version. Um, we have the strong and open source communities I referred to before, like our uh, meetup in, in London. I'm also running, co-organizing one in, in New York. Same holds true there as well. Um, this, is, this needs to be compared with some vendor-driven or small communities maybe that you might find. Then we have these days a wealth of books and resources and trainings. And um, uh, this for sure, holds not true for other languages and competitors. For some, maybe, but uh, I think the mix in the end is what makes uh, Python unbeatable in this regard. When we, when we think of machine learning and speak in the following of algorithmic trading, what we need is access to lots of historical and granular data sets. I will show you that FXM provides you with, it, with everything of this. Access to real-time streaming data, and of course, powerful soft and hardware to work with the data. So speaking of thick data, huge data, you need a little bit of hardware, but not kind of the big things in the world. Kind of, I would say for, to get started, every, every standard notebook that you might have and carry around on a daily basis will do. And Python as open source is readily available for all platforms, be it Windows, be it Mac or Linux.
This is a pyramid I use in all our trainings because this is how I like to structure thinking with regard to algorithmic trading and the technologies used. It all starts with the infrastructure, of course, but then we immediately get to the financial data question to how we can formulate strategies, um, how we can do backtesting, and this, these three layers here in the pyramid are the focus of the live demo that will follow. Then you need, of course, connecting code to the platform to so get uh, streaming data, to place orders and everything. This will be in the next webinar where we uh, will cover the uh, API, the REST API that will come out soon. And then you want to formulate a trading code. And last but not least, you recall uh, the ultimate goal is automation. So we want to have everything on a proper infrastructure and automatically, algorithmically running and hopefully making money. So this is kind of the high level overview. The live demo is now what we are going in. Um, I will first show what we will do during the live demo, then I will visit the, um, the question section and will answer the questions that have piled up in the meantime. First, I will have an example about using Python and Pandas for some simple backtesting. This is just to illustrate how efficient it is to work with financial data to uh, even do some, let's say, proper <laughs> algorithmic trading work in an abstract sense with Python and Pandas, one of the major packages. We will then uh, go and uh, see how we can work with FXCM historical tick data. We will add some indicators. This is really still experimental in a sense that we have started this endeavor, but I thought it would make sense to add it here because it will in the future be along here. And last but not least, I will show you kind of uh, modern approaches to get the data uh, visualized there. All the resources are hosted on this gist. So if you follow this short link, uh, you will get access to all the resources that I'm going to use. I will leave this now on the screen and quickly skip through the questions. Um, as pointed out before, there will be recordings where they will be stored will be announced later. Couple of questions here. So in the meantime, I hope you are able to uh, to get to the gist and have a quick look. In the meantime, when I quickly skip through the questions here, yeah. In in the meantime, there's a question: Why Python aren't other languages readable? Of course, this is like getting back to my analogy with regard to English, of course you can, in many parts of the world, you can speak Spanish as well, or French, for example, I'm pretty sure. Um, but, you know, I just visited India, and what I learned there is not that they have just a couple of dialects, even for me as a German, there are some German dialects. But I was told that in India, they have kind of 18 different languages in daily use by millions of people. 18 different languages in India. And what is kind of their common language where everybody is kind of talking to each other? It is English. So, of course, locally for a certain problem, I think there's a very good analogy you can use for whatever. But if you want to get by on a global basis, I think there is only um, the one thing. And of course, I'm biased because I make a living by uh, teaching people how to use Python for finance and algebra. Uh, there's also some question with regard to how well machines compete with human pattern and market psychology recognition. The basic assumption, of course, is that all is in the data. So um, you can think of a machine trying to emulate what humans might be doing, you know, like when you have uh, a self-driving car that tries to predict what the car in front of itself will do. Um, we can discuss this maybe to a later point, but I think machines are pretty well in that they simply abstract from psychology and see human patterns in terms of volume and, and all the, the stuff that we have there in the markets. There might be for some in between some audio issues, but seems to be kind of constrained to some only. Yeah, 
I can repost the, um, oh, sorry, I went here. I can repost the gist link. I post the gist link in the chat, in the chat once again. It was in the chat already, but maybe when you join later, you don't see it anymore. So I think I've now covered all the questions. Of course, we have many people in the webinar. So uh, everything is in the gist with regard to a Python version and so forth. So um, um, there's another question with regard to historic and live data. Live data will be shown next time. So when we talk about the REST API, we will show streaming data as well. So this will uh, be, and about the experience, I will comment on that, on that with regard to uh, whether people with no experience in Python, of course, you need to learn it a little bit, of course. It, it doesn't come along like by itself. Um, um, it doesn't come along by itself. So of course, a little bit of training, but I'm pretty sure if you have a little bit of background in technology, Python is the, one of the easiest languages to learn there. So there are other questions with regard to MT4 and Python and how uh, there are a couple of questions that should be from my point of view directed towards FXCM. I can only speak here in terms of algo trading and, um, and uh, Python. So if there are some questions that relate to FXCM strategy or what they're going to offer and so forth, I, I, um, I would recommend that you get in touch with uh, your contact persons or with the support there uh, directly because I don't want to say something that is not in line with the policy. But now let me jump into the little demo. And the one question that was there, can I learn Python if I don't have any background? I'm pretty sure that we now have many people here that are not Python experts, not even programming experts. And I think it still nowadays you can get by pretty well in daily life without being a, a data scientist, a computer scientist or whatnot. I'm completely aware of that. Uh, but I think that you are here with this background implies that you might expect something from algorithmic trading that you currently don't have available. So in that sense, I would say um, you should Give yourself a try, try to master it. And if I'm now going to show heavy, heavy code, um, then please don't be desperate. Just see it as kind of a uh, of wetting the appetite exercise in the sense that even experts who see this for the first time might not get all the details. But this is not about the details. This is just about showing how you can work. And I think the plots that we will see can be understood by everybody. So let me get started uh, with uh, this introduction, and I hope that the introduction allows me to get uh, a little bit faster through the code. Um, here I'm importing, and this is standard procedure in Python. I can even increase this a little bit. Um, I need to import the library before I use it. This is not true for everything in Python, but for most interesting things. So import pandas SPD, and here I'm providing a location to a data file. I can show you in the browser here. This is the data file. I got this data file from FXCM. So we need to thank FXCM for this data file here, uh, which I host there. And I need actually just to define the location. And with a single line of code here, it takes less than one second. I have read in this complete data set. So I don't need to take care actually, oh, well, data, how is this structure? There are dates, there are kind of headers and so forth. The intelligence, so to say, behind pandas allows me to read such data files in. So here you see 2,820 lines of open bit, high bit, low bit, close bit, and a couple of other data points. When we have a look at the first five rows, you see this is rendered kind of nicely here within Jupyter Notebook, what I'm using. And um, you know, these are just five rows from 2,820. I said it already for the human beings, uh, crunching thousand uh, numbers or going through thousand rows of data is not what we like to do and what we are good at. What we can do, we have a good grasp where we can have a visual look. And you see here, this is just, again, a little bit of importing and uh, parameterization. And it's another single line of code in Python using 
pandas throughout here. And I can visualize the close ask price here from uh, 27, something mid 27, to I think the data set ends in May uh, 2017. So this is uh, like uh, 10 years worth of data. And single line of code. And with regard to the question, can I learn that? I would say yes, because this is something in between using an application and hardcore programming. This is more or less just knowing the API. Here I access the column and here I call plot. And this is already the basic knowledge that I need. So no, let's say, difficult um, things involved there. Now I pick out a slightly smaller data set. So I start from 2014 so that we have nicer visualizations. This is this one line. So you see this is all. Everything that I, that I mentioned here is usually implemented in a single line of code. Here I calculate the mid price between close ask and close bid, also a single line of code. And now I'm adding simple moving averages. So the first two studies here, 10, days and 60 days. So just two lines of code needed. This is to get rid of um, not the number values. And once again, when we have a look at the graphic, you see here, this was just the base data, just close ask. Now, when I zoom in a little bit, we see that we have blue, which is the original data, where we here have derived mid from close ask and close bit. And we now have two simple moving averages. So as simple as that. Can do even more complex, more customized visualizations here as well. But just to show how easy it is. Now, when we speak of algorithmic trading, I want to show you this. Uh, and there are just six lines left to get to the performance of an SMA-based strategy. Um, we can, based on our SMA, we can derive positions. What is typically the reasoning behind SMA-based strategies? Yeah, when the green line, let me speak now graphically, when the green line is below the red one, then we want to be short the market. If the green one, the shorter moving average, if this is above the red line, then we want to be long the market. And this is what is translated in code. So my, my verbal explanation is translated into formal code here. Again, a single line where I check for every single day in my data set what the position is. And um, fast execution. And now I can go and plot even here the positions where you see we would start with a long position, plus one, going to a short position, minus one, plus one, and so forth. So we see a couple of trades. So it's not too frequent that we trade here based on Euro, US uh, dollar exchange rate. Of course, I'm not considering here transaction calls, nor do I go about uh, detailed bid ask um, um, analysis, nor um, do I include any leverage, for example. So of course, there are many, many simplifications, but this basic framework is easily enhanced to incorporate more and more realistic features. But my approach here is to say, well, we have two SMAs, we derive position from the two SMAs, and now let us check whether following such a strategy in our simplified setting might bring some benefit compared to a passive investment. And to this end, I calculate returns, then I calculate the uh, returns of the strategy. Returns here are the market returns. Our market instrument is your yes dollar. Can trade, for example, a CFD based on this instrument. Again, currently abstracting from any leverage and so forth. And the last line, which already finishes this example, now compares the strategy with going long and short, compares it to the benchmark investment of just being long. I mean, here it's somehow like a no brainer. <laughs> for the benchmark investment because we can see what the benchmark passive investment does. So it loses in value. But the question is how good are we to capture the shorts? And in particular, this long period where the market decreases is captured kind of well. And then over the other period or the rest of the period, it's kind of going more or less in parallel. This is not about any kind of investment advice um, and that you should follow this right now because we have by incident found something that is uh, that seems to be profitable. 
uh, many, many more things need to be done in order to come to a realistic view on such a strategy. But having the focus on Python, I just wanted to show that with a few lines of code, we work with real financial data going back over multiple years. We do easy visualization with a single line of code. We formulate our strategies based on SMAs here in this case. Others are equally simple to implement. Uh, we calculate returns and strategy returns. So it's Let's say if we, if we shrink it together, it might be 10 lines of code in Python, and we have done a complete exercise, a complete cycle from reading the data to having a benchmark of the passive investment versus the strategy that we have derived. I think this is hardly beatable by other, um, by other approaches. The major focus is on tick data. And I don't know if you know, but FXCM, since quite a while, provides uh, complete tick data history, which is not the standard. And I want to show you now how you can go about and benefit from the tick data that is there uh, based on Python. And not only on Python, but what we have implemented here is a uh, little class to which you have access in the gist as well. So this is the code that I'm going to use. It's 124 lines of code. Here in the gist, you find it at the end. So when I scroll down the gist, it's after the notebook. First technical indicators, this is a little bit lengthy, but still experimental <laughs> until you find it. So you have access to what I'm going to use. This simplifies reading and working with fixed data considerably. So before, Pandas is a standard package that I don't know how many, I would say, I would say, um, I would say uh, millions of people are using. So Pandas, NumPy, some others are used by millions. This is something brand new, but you can use it in the same way. So here, the file contains a class, and I now make use of class. So the, the class is called FXCM Tick Reader, and for example, there's one class method that I can call, and I get back the available instrument. So you see here that tick data is uh, basically available for the uh, exchange rate pair that are listed there. My example in the following is based on Euro US dollar as before. Before I had kind of the static file that I've stored on my server, um, end of day data. Now we are, go, we are going to retrieve tick data. So pandas is what's used again. We define a start and stop date. So I intentionally have chosen two dates from last week so that we are pretty current. Um, now when I read it, you see I have a time magic command in front here. This takes a little while. Why does it take a little while? Yeah, we retrieve here a weekly data set, a weekly CSV file, which is gzipped. The object, the Python object, is now of type FXM tick reader. And when I have a look at the data, you see that for uh, last week here, this is from the 15th of October going to the 20th of October, we have retrieved 1 million data points. So this is indeed kind of a bit of data. <laughs> Again, nothing for us humans, but for a machine, it's the same as, uh, or basically the same as a thousand or a hundred data rows. And this is the structure of the tick data set. So we have just a timestamp and we have bid and ask for this timestamp. Uh, see how granular the time now is. So we are, of course, in a completely different dimension than when we talk about uh, end of day data here. So now we want to work with the tick data. This is just the raw data. You see here, get raw data, get raw data. This is, this is what we have retrieved. Um, in order to have it as convenient as before, there's another uh, method here, which is called get data. This takes now a while because some, um, yeah, let's say heavy transformation is taking in the back end. And the major workload stems from the fact that we transform the date time, which is delivered as a string object to a Python object. So this is a rather technical issue. And you see for the first time, when I do it for the first time, it takes kind of five seconds, close to five seconds on my MacBook. And when I do it for the second time, so this is implemented uh, in a lazy fashion, as we say, 
then you see it just takes seven milliseconds. So this is a one-off, if you like. Um, one-off in the sense that once we have achieved this transformation in the background, we don't see it going on, but we notice it since it takes a while. Once we have achieved it, we have everything in memory that we want to have, and then I get access to it in seven milliseconds. I think this is a slight difference between five seconds and seven milliseconds. Now I can not only work with kind of the complete data set, like oh, 1 million data points, what I can do here, you see, I pick out the 20th last Friday from eight o'clock to four o'clock p.m., 16. So when I do this, you see pretty fast, a little bit slower because there is some um, slicing taking place. And now I have just 100,000 data points. So it's something like a tenth of the data set. I can now take this smaller data set and you see here the plot of it. Recall before when you saw the first plots, this was about um, end of day data. Now you see data over a single day. So here you see nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock for the 20th of October. So we have the data, the tick data available in our fantastic Python world. So we can use pandas, we can do visualizations, we can also go about and add some moving averages that we had before. But to make life a little bit easier, we have created another file. This is the longer Python file in the gist. Again, uh, cannot emphasize it enough. It's still experimental, but it works already. So this is our original data set. I now resample my data set to one minute bars because probably my strategy is not on tick data. My strategy that I follow is a minute strategy. So I need to have data that is on minute bars. And here you see 480 minutes. So like eight hours times 60. Um, as simple as that. I resample my data. I need to make sure that the labeling is correct and take the last value there. Now I have a much smaller data set, but maybe for my strategy, the exactly correct data set. Importing the other file and now creating a technical analysis object, I have a little bit of an easier time now in that I can calculate simple moving averages with a different, um, with a different interface. So here you see I can get the numbers simply printed out or with a single line, I get a print. This is usually, this is not something that we want to have. We want to have this now compared to the, um, to the mid price, for example, because yeah, we can plot it, but the question is what do we do with it? Therefore, you see here SMA, and there is the other method, which is called at SMA, and all the at methods, they at indeed, the columns to the data set. And now you see in TA, get data, I have the original data in the form of MIT, and I have the two simple moving averages. And now I have a visualization with three lines of code of the original MIT data points, one minute bars, plus the half hour and the one hour simple moving averages. Kind of fantastic. Bollinger Bands, just to show that there is a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more as well. Also Bollinger Bands, easily added. Three lines of code, upper, lower, picking out the columns and plotting it. Relative strength, and you see the, the pattern, <laughs> speaking of pattern recognition, the pattern repeats itself. So RSI, when we add RSI, you see here as a little plot. 14 minutes and you see it green. This is not the nicest visualization. Um, and the library that I'm talking about that we are in the course of developing uh, is basically not about visualization itself. It's more or less about the calculation of the data to be then used by machine learning algorithms or whatnot. So uh, I will show a much more appealing visualization approach in a second. Now we can that we have all the data away uh, together, we can combine the data sets into a single one where we have the simple moving average here green, then we have the dashed magenta ones, which are the Bollinger Bands, 
uh, we have here the uh, RSI with the 30 and 70 lines visualized. So this might be already something you can work with or you say, well, uh, not good enough for me, but uh, be assured in the Python world in principle, when it gets to visualization, everything can be achieved. The question is only how, uh, how to go about it and what to do. But what I now want to show is something that might be more appealing for the, uh, for the analyst, for the chartist, for somebody who the stage trading and so forth. And this is the last part. After that, we will have time. I will have time to answer more questions. Um, because the general approach is that you work with candlesticks. So you have something like open, high, low, close data. And before I behaved in a sense that I did a resampling from tick data to one minute, but I just took the last value, which is the close for the interval. So I simplified the data set and thinking in terms of open, high, low, close, we can achieve the same thing with more granularity in what we are used to, namely in that we once again say 100,000 ticks, then we take the mid data points to have mid. And now we are not only taking the last value like this, we take the first one, the maximum, the minimum. So these four now represent later on our open, high, low, close values. First for open, max for high, min for low, L for close. Just kind of this the technical representation of our um, financial expressions. So frequency one minute, and I do the same resampling from before, and now I have a different data set. It has again 480 minutes worth of data, but now OHLC. When I have a look at the data, you see uh, somehow the highest level, lowest, seems to make somehow sense. And of course, I can do a naive plot, naive in the sense that I simply take this data and call plot on the data frame. This does not, does not look really nice, but this is my intention to have a plot here that doesn't look really nice. Because what we want to have now based on the data are uh, candlestick bars. And the combination of Plotly and Cufflinks um, brings us into another dimension when we talk about visualization. So importing cufflinks and just calling now iplot on my data frame, you see that in, instead of this static plot, this is a bitmap, this is just pixels. You know, I cannot do anything with it was, uh, but saving on disk. But this is now a D3GS interactive graphic where I can, for example, zoom in here and analyze the data much more closely. I can embed this on a on a web page and do many fantastic things with it. You see here by just uh, setting best fit true, I even get a linear fit for my data. So if this makes sense for you, it's a different question. I just wanted to illustrate that uh, it's as easy as that. Now speaking of charting and nicer plotting, there is this quant figure object, quant fig. And you see when I feed in my open, high, low, close data, you might not notice it yet, but we have here upwards movement as blue and downwards movements as gray. And when I zoom in in such an area, you see that we now have interactive candlestick charts. And the overhead is marginal. You know, this is a single line where I just say title with a legend displays and so forth. So, I can zoom in further and analyze that stuff. But not only that, not only that we have interactivity and some candlestick charts, we can go and use the same data and add some simple moving averages as we did before. Now our candlestick charts, three simple moving averages, 10, 30, 60. I can even click here on the legend and the SMAs vanish. Another click and I see the SMAs. Bollinger band. We have seen already before. Now we see it here in action. Same holds true, clicking on the legend. Bollinger band vanishes. They vanish. I can click this on and you see how this works. Uh, like before, always I can zoom in, analyze, and do different things here with the data. So much more granular, much better suited for. Uh, visual uh, chart-based analysis. The very last example that I have here is the RSI. 
And the RSI you see here is not in the base figure now anymore because we have a crowded base figure. We get the RSI as a separate subplot down here. Same holds true. We can, we can always go in and, and zoom. Um, here the scaling is of course not as optimal, but same holds true like before where we can get because we now have two subfigures. The zooming just takes place within the subfigure. But with you see, just a few lines of code again, I would say not more than 10 relevant lines of code. With our data, we are able to create interactive charts, open, high, low, close data, Bollinger Band, three SMAs, RSI, and of course there is much more, but we don't have that much more time that I could show you more. Uh, you have access to all these codes that are there. I want to, therefore, since I've reached the end of the live demo, I want to quickly go back here and put the gist code again on the screen so that you for sure know where we are going. So here is the code, the Google short link code, so to say, to get to the gist. And I'm now taking the time to answer maybe for five more minutes so that we have 60 minutes full afterwards the questions that we have. So um, I'm just now putting in the chat room um, the email address where you can send general question, um, uh, general questions. So uh, I just put it in the chat. So it's info at FXCM. And whenever I say this is a question for FXCM or uh, your question doesn't get answered, um, please reach out to FXCM via the email info at FXCM. Have a look at the chat here. <clears throat> there's an interesting question. How do you code subjective visual pattern in a code? Um, I think there's a whole discipline of uh, 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 there's this concern with this. Um, the basic approach in the past in finance as well as in trading has been that people have come up with an idea. Like one of a good example that I like to use is that, for example, the capital asset pricing model, one of the first financial theories that uh, gain some popularity with regard to pricing and deriving betas and so forth and also used for trading and so forth. In principle, a completely theoretical model. Somebody brilliant came up with it, like Sharp Lindner and all these uh, brilliant uh, researchers back then. And only then they started testing whether it worked. And unfortunately, the theory, really nice, really elegant, didn't prove uh, to be that robust in the real world. So. When I speak of artificial intelligence, machine and deep learning, the basic idea is that you go the other way around, that you don't start with your own hypothesis, but that you say, well, the machine is much better at pattern recognition. I might have an idea of one or two certain patterns, but the machine will test in a single run, let's say, a million or a billion different patterns. And most, most, most probably it will come across the pattern and will either say, well, this is something good or not good. So in that sense, the whole machine and artificial intelligence area has turned things upside down. So usually researchers came up or traders or what with ideas and then they tested it in the markets. Now you have the potential based on modern technology to go the other way around. You have the data. You don't need to have a look. You just have your agent, your machine learning uh, agent who runs and sees and, and checks immediately whether there might be something in it. So this is how I would approach it. But there are other approaches as well, which allow you to formulate your own strategies. Um, there's somebody pointing out that my uh, reference to 18 languages in India uh, is not correct, probably more than 100. <laughs> um, all questions with regard to MT4 and how uh, this relates to Python and so forth, uh, please, because there are a couple of these questions, please send them to uh, FXCM. Um, 
Live data access will be covered in the next webinar to go to REST API. So today was about historical. Um, I commented on the learning. <clears throat> There's a question uh, why FXCM is uh, kind of pursuing this initiative. Yeah, because I think this is what the market says. So many, many people uh, who used to be, let's say, passive investors turn to day traders uh, now want to do it algorithmically. I mean, this is what we deal with with thousands over, over a year as well uh, from all over the world people want to do. And it's not only Wall Street anymore. Even the retail trader has all the technology available in kind of a democratized fashion to get started with algorithmic trading. And this is kind of a fantastic thing from my point of view. Um, there's a question with regard to, I, I've shown real Python code. I think this is an earlier question. <laughs> uh, we will show much more. Um, uh, one, so there are a couple of questions related to, um, related to getting started with Python and so forth. There are many, many free uh, Python courses um, available. I put one and I put at least uh, because this is our core business. I'm I'm daring to put our own link here if you want to have a look. We have a, I think a good starter course uh, which is called Finance with Python, just to get uh, started easily and gently, and not assuming any background knowledge. Um, so you might have a look um, at our web page. And but there are also good general courses most probably not finance directed for free uh, at the online universities and so forth. So <clears throat> uh, yeah, there's a question with regard to Bitcoin and Python. Sure, sure, sure. There's, uh, uh, there are rappers, Bitcoin plays a role, not in mining, but for all the rappers, for wallets and so forth, uh, Python. Uh, if you if you go to YouTube, you will find a two and a half hour webinar that I have given where I explain how Bitcoin mining, hashing, encryption, everything works based on plain Python code. So, uh, of course, this is uh, there an important um, question as well. Uh, there's somebody asking about Delphi 7. Frankly, I don't have any experience, so I'm not the right person to uh, to comment on that one. So. Uh, sure, I will. Um, you have access to the Jupyter file in the gist. So, um, blockchain technology, Python, yeah, sure. What is Pandas? Pandas is a fantastic library. So, if you go to, uh, if you look this up, this is one of the biggest libraries. So, pandas.pydata.org. Now, it just brings me to my one of my standard links. I wanted to show you the starting page, of course. So Python data analysis library, this is one of the most popular ones. So Pandas is a major library. Um, let me quickly check what the documentation says. So the last time I checked the documentation, it was like 1,500 pages or so. So it's a very powerful data, <laughs> 1,500, you see. Now the documentation of Pandas alone, not of Python, of Pandas alone, stands at 2,200 pages. This is kind of a little bit of an indicator uh, for what Pandas can do for you, namely quite a bunch when it gets to data and financial analysis. Uh, fundamentals can, of course, also be included. With regard to fundamentals, what you need to make sure is that you have access to fundamentals. But uh, even natural language processing is kind of something that is easily achieved with, um, with uh, Python. It's actually a strength of Python. API feeds, again, will be the, uh, the topic of uh, the next webinar. So when we talk about RESTful APIs, getting streaming data and so forth will be the topic of the next one. <laughs> no, there is, there is no, <laughs> it's all experimental. Somebody's asking about pip install and FXCM tick reader. Uh, it's just in the gist. So uh, please copy it into your local folder, copy the clone, the complete gist, and you should be good to go. But it's not yet on, on PyPy. So um, there's somebody asking about craft lab. I don't know what this means. So. <laughs> um, 
Um, G, uh, there's a question with regard to tick data and timing. I would assume that it is GMT. It's a good question, actually. Uh, but we should confirm with FXCM in this regard whether it is indeed GMT. Good question. Um, another technical question with regard to resampling. A resampling is that we have usually per minute, we might have a thousand ticks or let's say a hundred ticks at least. Um, but we want to work with one minute bar data and resampling just resamples it from 100 ticks to one minute bar. Uh, and in the last example, I then uh, created also open high low close data. There are some questions with regard to libraries or um, like Arun has mentioned, I've never heard of it, frankly. So of course the technology universe is unlimited almost these days. So uh, I cannot comment on everything here. Then there's a question whether something besides pandas needs to be imported. No, you see you, what I've imported is shown in the Jupyter Notebook. So um, this is basically it. So this is what is done. No, the real-time database is not updated in real-time. It's currently done on a weekly basis, but uh, work is also ongoing to have this in a more timely manner. Um, but the tick data uh, source that I've shown you is not uh, updated in real-time. There's another question with regard to uh, the uh, what is what will be available um, to FXCM traders, and uh, basically the webinar series now is a little bit uh, like front running in a sense that we show stuff. Um, for example, next webinar that might not be available to everybody at this particular point in time. What I've shown today is available to everybody. So every retail client, even if you have not an account, this is uh, publicly accessible, uh, what I am going to show in the next webinar will be something that will be rolled out over time to all the retail traders. So uh, all the functionality, all the analysis capabilities, the interaction with the RESTful API, everything will be available to retail clients in the future. Uh, the, the exact timeline is not yet fixed, but expect it to be available sooner than then later uh, because uh, many different uh, groups are working currently on this particular uh, project. Um, there's somebody asking about TensorFlow. Yeah, if you are interested, just uh, uh, look up my other gists, for example, or uh, have a visit to our training page. So we use TensorFlow intensively and it works pretty well in the areas that we are talking about. But I cannot, of course, comment on details here. Um, the gist link is still shown. Oh, well, we have still a few questions left. I'm working here through all the questions. I'm really happy that we get such uh, such a high involvement. Um, yeah, some people are pointing out that they're waiting for things to come. Um, uh, of course, we will add on that. We could just cover uh, this one topic today, but we will add more as we go. Um, maybe I can include in the third webinar, because they are now towards the end, a couple of questions with regard to neural networks and TensorFlow and uh, all kind of the same topic. I can include there at least a machine learning based one, which is simply enough to be included and where we show this um, both in a historical setting as well as in a live trading setting. Um, so this should be possible that we that we have this covered because obviously there is huge interest uh, interest uh, is there. Also questions regard to how can we use existing um, data and so forth. We will cover strategies when you have read the outline um, later on. Um, with regard to setting up a demo account uh, with FXCM, please reach out to FXCM on the info at fxcm.com. So uh, they will for sure help you and point you in the right direction. We don't have any special demo account if the question was about this, but the general one people. Um... Let's 
So, uh, so I'm just getting towards the end, <laughs> needing, to, <laughs> needing to read through all these, what you call it. But yeah, the video recordings will be available. They will be available, of course, but you have at least all the, uh, uh, all the questions. Then there's another question with regard to MATLAB. So I don't want to bash other languages. I'm a big fan of Python, not necessarily meaning that I don't like others as well. Uh, but this is what our business is centered around. And um, with regard to how Python compares to MATLAB, uh, I would refer you to the slide that I've used uh, where I pointed out the benefits of Python vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, vendor-driven languages like MATLAB. You can use Visual Studio with Python, of course, but there are many, many others. I don't use Visual Studio, um, but uh, Visual Studio has, as a first-class citizen, uh, Python these days as well. Yeah, with regard to learning and AI, I think Python has uh, kind of everything available. Um, then there are questions with regard to fast, slow, stochastic code. So, some questions are really special in the sense of that people have something in mind that they have used in the past. So we don't have everything available yet, but we will work on it and improving it, starting with the standards, the most popular indicators and so forth. But bear with us, uh, expect many more things to come, um, to come soon. <laughs> then there are questions we got to uh, our courses. Uh, please visit the page. Uh, you'll find everything on the page that I shared, like contents, pricing, and everything. Um, yeah, the general comment is seeing the benefits of Python. Fantastic. Uh, beyond the fax rates. Uh, a typical question is the one that I have now open here is where do you get access to options data, economic uh, indicators? Um, frankly, you probably need kind of a paid subscription. So the open data trend is not, has not arrived in every area. Quandl might be a, somehow a source to get started, but otherwise you need to resort to the, uh, to the incumbents like uh, Tom's Reuters Icon, with which we have a cooperation with also Bloomberg, of course. Uh, but uh, you might know that this involves, of course, licensing fees, um, as we all know. So, um, another question, how to get started, whether learn it but on your own or work with a, with a coder. I would recommend that you start working with somebody who knows it a little bit, who is able to teach you and that you later on uh, start doing stuff on your own. Because uh, even if you have a steep learning curve, you want to make sure that when you bet money on what you do, it somehow works. So, having a second pair of eyes might be a good, um, good thing there. Um, supervised learning, MT4. So I, I won't cover MT4 in this regard. Um, yeah, connecting code, trading code, this is what we are going to cover in the next um, one. So I'm pretty sure that all the questions that we have there will be answered at least in later ones, uh, recordings. A typical handling outliers, another specific question. It depends on what you understand in terms of outlier and so forth. So. Um, FXCM tick reader is something you need to import. I've provided you the resources to that. Um, more questions piling up. I'm thinking ahead. Um, no, I didn't say that the next webinar is only for traders who have an account with FXCM, but uh, if you want to make use of uh, what I'm going to show, um, you can. Uh, you can still watch, but you, you will need at least a demo account to later on uh, really apply this on your own because you need to be registered, you need to have an account, uh, otherwise you can't use the API because the account is kind of a necessary prerequisite to get started. But on the other hand, even if you have an account yet, it doesn't guarantee that you can immediately get started. So it's, it's no guarantee. Um, so, so the presentation is uh, uh, will not be emailed. We have shared the link, so uh, I don't believe in, in emailing megabytes of data. Um, just uh, follow the link of the slides. You find it also in the gist here. That's the reason why I leave it open. Um, so, a couple of other questions. Oh, somebody says open oh, demo account. Was Ninja Trader? Uh, I don't comment on the platforms. Uh, Python. In principle, Python works on mobile devices, but you don't want to program anything on mobile devices. Um, uh, 
following up question on Visual Studio, I basically code in Sublime, uh, but usually on Wim on the shelf. So uh, really, really down to earth. Slides are provided. I can once again share the slides. Please have a look in the uh, chat. So there is the link to the slides and to the gist. And what is an API? This is, my God, this is kind of a perfect closing question. Uh, what is an API? This application programming interface. An API is something that gives you access in a programmatic way to data. So this time we downloaded data and crunched the data. So next time when we talk about the API, we won't go and download anything, let's say, unnecessary on bulk. We just retrieve from the API exactly what we ask for. So very good closing question. Really thankful for that one, what an API is. From that sense, we are now well over time, but I think I've gotten through 90% plus of the questions. If there are some questions left, feel free to reach out to info at fxcm.com. You have my contact information as well. Um, going back to my slides, you see it here, team at tpq.io, or in the gist, you find the information as well. Uh, just reach out to FXCM, reach out uh, to us, but best to FXCM, and we are happy to answer all your questions, how to get started, how to make use of Python, how to go about algorithmic trading with FXCM. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the two upcoming seminars will shed light on, uh, on most of the questions that might remain open at this point in time. But this was intentionally to get started with something that is already there that you can immediately use. Tick data is there, make use of it, go about and test it. And in the next uh, ones, we will show how to then use the brand new offering, not yet out, the RESTful API, where you can get circle data, streaming data, can place orders programmatically. Fantastic times, from my point of view, uh, one of the most exciting times ever, in particular when you're in trading and interested in algorithmic trading. And it remains for me to say happy Python coding, happy algorithmic trading, and see you for the next webinar. Take care. Bye-bye.